in this lecture series on uh, what we're calling gene interactions or loci interactions, which really the mode of inheritance that we're dealing with here is epistasis. Uh, we've talked about really the basis of what this means, how two loci or more loci can interact with each other. Uh, we've gone through uh, some of the really basic forms of this type of interaction, giving you single recessive, double recessive, single dominant, double dominant, as well as illustrating some other base common models that we see from a two locus interaction model. Uh, and there are much more complicated models out there that, that uh, we're finding more and more about as we sequence more and more systems and start to understand more of these complex uh, phenotypes. But what I thought I'd do is kind of step over for a moment before we start working problems and just talk a little bit about uh, some examples of epistatic phenotypes, some that you probably have seen around for yourself and maybe have even wondered about. But uh, they're kind of ones you can you can have as a common thing. So when you start working and thinking through these epistatic problems, you go, yeah, I remember, I remember something about that. So <clears throat> some of these examples, one, let's go back to single recessive epistasis, okay? And in that, we have this 9-3-4 ratio. Uh, and we talked about some examples of that, but one of the good ones is, is in dogs, domestic dogs. Domestic dogs have what's called an e-locus, an expressor locus, and that Working with other loci, several other loci, in fact, controls the way that we see coat color uh, in dogs. One really good example would be in the Labradors. Uh, you have black labs, chocolate labs, and yellow labs. And what really drives that is a combination of this expressor locus, the, which is called the E locus, uh, and then the color locus, which is the B locus, which has to do with the amount of melanin, uh, eumelanin that's produced. Okay, um, and in these forms, the E actually drives production of the of eumelanin uh, in the melanophores, and so you get black dogs. So if you've got one big E, it sort of takes over. So remember, we're dealing with a nine three three one ratio. Um, when you have this other locus being at the recessive condition, uh, but you have this this turned on this full expression, you end up with what's called chocolate. And then when you turn off that expression, when you go to another form, no matter what happens over in the B locus over here, once you have this expressor turned off, you basically go to yellow. So we have the yellow forms that are, that are found. Okay? And you know you can see that from this, if you take a uh, black lab that happens to be a, a dihybrid het for both of these, and you cross it with another black lab that's a dihybrid het, uh, that you would end up with exactly what you expect. If they have enough progeny over time and you keep looking at the same cross, you'd see about nine blacks uh, for every three of these browns for every four yellows, single recessive epistasis. Okay? So it's a, it's a just nice form. So you can now look around as people walk around with their dogs and stuff. You can say, oh, yeah, that's a, I kind of understand the genetics, the simple genetics that's underneath that. Now, let's talk a little bit about, you know, we did with uh, things like some squash color. We tried to explain at least a little bit about how you get these colors on these forms. And I think this is a good one to talk about because it brings in several basic ideas about how these genetic systems really work, at least at the, at the protein level. What you have is that you have melanocytes, right? Melanocytes are these cells that produce um, the color, the hair color, skin color, things in our skin. And they're really are two primary things that can go on. Uh, there's melanin, which is a yellow coloration, and there is eumelanin, which is the dark coloration. And the pathways to produce those are turned on by, are turned off by outside signals. There is a gene called an agouti gene, and that agouti gene can be picked up by what's called the MC1R receptor protein. So this is a this is a sort of a a GUTI is like a hormone if you think of it that way. It's not technically a hormone, but it's a protein produced at one place uh, in the body. When it reaches one of these melanocyte cells, if there is a receptor protein there that can grab it, it will grab it. And what it does is basically blocks this transfer melanin pathway uh, so that you don't go down along the eumelanin pathway, but you shunt over and produce this yellow coloration. That's called a goody. Okay? Another way that you can also get yellow, which is what we actually see in the yellow labs themselves, is if there is a mutation in this MC1R system where you can't grab 
this melanin, uh, excuse me, you can't grab uh, a hold of this agouti antigen, okay, and you can't have this ligand come in and ligate to cause the, the movement across the membrane and then the activation of this pathway. So by default, it sort of defaults off to yellow, all right? The way we get <coughs> black, or at least solid black in uh, domesticated dogs, it turns out, and this is only a recent find in the last few years, is that there is a beta defensin ver uh, variant. So this is a, another protein. It's usually associated, interestingly, with uh, immune system response. But in this case, there's a special form of it in domestic dogs. Uh, there's a, a called the K form that will bind with this MC1 receptor. So it's a ligand that we'll bind with that. And in doing so, it actually activates this eumelanin and, and, and intensifies this eumelanin production in these skin cells. And it outcompetes. That's what this competitive binding is. When it's present in its uh, primary form, it will actually outcompete a goody uh, for this to be attached and transferred in. So you end up with these, these dogs that are black. So there's a couple of different ways to get yellow. It's, it's produced by the same uh, product in the melanocyte, but the reason that it's produced, it varies. One is because you actually have a direct interaction with this agouti ligand that drives this process. Another is that the process just moves on by itself because there's a failure to drive it, and it's, it differs in different breeds of dogs. Okay? Uh, something else to point out, like the, the, if you see these dogs with a black mask, like here, What's happening there is actually that you've, you've ended up with uh, this agouti is in control of everything, right? It's actually the, the primary thing that's going on. Now, when you get a mass like this, there's actually another mutational form that drives the system. But these guys, because they look like this, this yellow is really going on because of this agouti attraction here. That's the same way with this Great Dane. It's got a mask, and these little guys have mask here as well. Just something really kind of, you know, for to bring it to humans for a moment. Um, there are a lot of people, a lot of men that when they grow their beards out, uh, their beards end up being a different color than their hair. Their hair is often dark colored and their beards may be yellow. I mean, yellow, maybe uh, red colored. Okay? Um, and so they grow and they go, well, wait, you got black hair, dark hair, okay, and maybe dark eyebrows and things. And then suddenly your your beard is red. How does that happen? Well, it turns out that when this happens, these individuals, most of them, and it's not 100% like anything, but a vast majority of these individuals are heterozygous for this locus here. Okay? And so they've got uh, an effect that where essentially the agouti is dominating in one place okay, and not dominating in the other. So they're getting dark hair, but here they just simply don't get it and, and it shows up. So it's a, there's been some nice you know, science work done on how these individuals could end up with this. And it's really, a, they're, they tend to be heterozygous for different mutations that occur. Uh, and this goes even further. This, what happens with this, um, MC1R protein is that it's a transmembrane protein, meaning that where it is is that you have the membrane surface uh, of your melanocyte, and this thing weaves in and out of this of this melanocyte surface. And so when these antigens come in, um, when these ligands, I keep saying antigens, sorry, when these ligands come in and attach to this protein, this helps move them across, okay? to the intercellular area. And there are all kinds of mutations that can occur. And this, this one little region right here, you can see that there are mutations found in mouse and cow and pigs, uh, sheep and foxes and all sorts of things that give these unique colors. One of the cool ones that has been found fairly recently happens to be the difference between what's known as a jaguar and a jaguarundi. Uh, these are actually animals that are found in Mexico and Central America. Uh, and on down. Uh, there's some reports of both jaguars and jaguarundis even uh, in Alabama. <laughs> there's uh, never been a, a full, a well-documented sighting, but they probably well did occur here in the occasionals. But anyway, jaguars got these spotty types of forms that look like this, very, very distinctive form when you see them. Jaguarundis are close relative to those, but they don't have this spotty color. But they do come in sort of this light orangey color or they come in sort of a solid, dark, almost gray color. It's more similar to, to both of these things. And the jaguar has a deletion mutation uh, found. Uh, that's what this little little delta here is for right here. The triangle means there's a there's a, a mutation of, at about 15 in this 
in, upon this gene, and it causes this, this spotty formation that occur like this. The jaguarundis have another deletion that's found around 24, so it's further down, and so they actually don't have the spots. They simply either come out as a, essentially having the, the uh, agouti gene come in and cause them to be yellow, or they go along and have this, this eumelatin production that makes them solid black. So that's kind of cool. Um, other things you see is that the humans have a number of these mutations of different forms. One of them is uh, a, a mutation that drives redheadedness, right? Um, redheads don't produce eumelanin effectively, uh, and it's they do produce uh, uh, the other colors that they, they go toward the, the promel, the, uh, melatonin, so they have lighter skin, uh, they're redheaded, obviously, uh, and a number of interesting things. So obviously they have freckles, uh, they have much lighter skin, which is a good and bad thing. For one, the, the redhead skin produce much more vitamin D, so they don't really even have to go out into the sun to, to put the vitamin D that many individuals have. Of course, their hair is red. Uh, they experience pain greater, which is interesting, um, and they uh, actually uh, can take uh, more anesthetic when they go in for surgery. People realize that they're redheads, and as part of the medical practice, they'll actually uh, provide them with more uh, of the anesthesia. Uh, they're more sensitive to temperature changes, um, and they, uh, unfortunately, uh, they are more sensitive to uh, things like Parkinson's disease is more common in, in true redheads. And of course, because of that really light skin and all that, uh, uh, melanomas and, and other uh, sun-based uh, uh, damage is, is more common, uh, but they're otherwise stronger individuals, and you know they've got uh, some very, they're very unique in, in their ability to do other things. Even though they're sensitive, and they're sensitive, very they can detect differences in temperature um, better than people who have dark hair and dark skin. So you know it's it's really interesting. They have all these mutations that play a role all through this one basic system here with these other genes that come into play. Uh, uh, sort of synergistically with it. And just one more little example of that. Uh, if you ever get a chance to go out to the desert southwest, uh, and maybe you go to the White Sands um, Range or some place, but you go on, the, there's a lava beds and things. If you get into New Mexico, the Chihuahuan Desert, there are these lizards that occur there. Uh, they're whip tails, very similar to things we have around here, fence lizards. Um, and scloppers are, are here. Uh, and of course, out in this environment where it's dark and grassy and things, they're relatively dark colored so that they're cryptic and they can hide. Uh, when you get into these light habitats, both species have uh, changed. They have changed and morphed where uh, they are much lighter and they, they can work on sand. So both makes them less visible on sand as well as probably you don't want to be a really, really dark thing out here in white sands because it's so hot that you need some way to dissipate heat. So they don't want to absorb too much heat when they're out there. Uh, so at least evolutionarily they don't. And what's really interesting about them is that while both species have become lighter, they've done it in two different ways. Um, one of them, the whip tail, has actually mutated this, this um, MC1R uh, protein so that it doesn't transport the ligands anymore. And so it just doesn't bring any across at all. So there's no melanin production or essentially a, a very limited amount of melanin production. Um, the fence lizard has actually mutated it as well, but in a completely different place. And what happens there is that the protein simply can't bind to the membrane. So it's not a matter of trans its ability to transport or not. It simply doesn't even come up and bind. So two completely different mutations of the same gene actually end up producing uh, quite the, the similar effects, but for very, very different molecular re reasons. So I think that's kind of interesting. All right, one other, the last little example here, just to kind of pull in, we're talking about um, epistasis and what can happen. Remember lethality and death? Well, guess what? there are epistatic forms of, of lethality that occur too. Uh, one of them in is, are in these sort of carps, and you can have uh, this one form like this, this heterozygous form. If it's combined up with a second locus, you can get scaled. Uh, if that's a heterozygous at that locus, you can get lines along the lateral line in the back. However, if it forms up with this NN, you actually get death, right? So this is a sort of, in this sense, a recessive lethal that's epistatic to the form. So it's working as a normal function to provide scale patterns, 
But when it gets into a certain combination here where you've got this NN allele, it becomes a recessive lethal. Recessive, now don't worry about the big ends or little ends. Recessive means you have to have two copies to kill you. And so that's when it happens up here. Uh, the little s's, okay, epistatically give us mirrored. They can give us, you know, a form, and that results in either mirrored like this, uh, which just has these scales scattered around the body. Uh, so it's uh, basically something like this line, but you kind of remove the line and move them to other areas, all the way to what's called leathered. Because the leather is basically the their scales, but they're pretty much absent along these these the body form here. Uh, and again, either one of those little s, little s combined with big n, big n is a lethal system. So that would be an epistatic lethal, if you think about it in that form. And we're actually going to play with one of those in our problem sets when we start uh, in next. All right, so now what I want to do is the uh, next two parts of this lecture, uh, go back and actually work with some of these epistatic ratios. The first one will be sort of a general way, okay, this is how you would do, in general, epistatic problems. The second one will be, uh, let's really try some problems, some word problems. Here's a big complex word problem, happens to evolve some epistasis. How do we pull the stuff out that we need and answer the questions?